it's a bit of a stretch. I think one could f fix it there. I mean, there are a number of, I, I did a study uh, with some colleagues for, of, of universities uh, in terms of their leadership development. Um, but applying that model to that, one of the th big differences between universities is on the one hand you've got Oxbridge and on the other hand you've got the uh, post-92 ex-polytechnics. Now somewhere like uh, Bedfordshire University or University of um, West of England uh, near to you will replace, you know, maybe a quarter of their courses every year with the latest thing in hairdressing or nail painting or whatever. Whereas Oxbridge uh, probably only two, changes one course every couple of years. Uh, now the thing about that is, so they're at the generative level. Um, Oxbridge is and the like, from Durham, St Andrews and the ancients in this country. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, whereas um, post-92 ex-polytechnics are kind of hyper-adaptive and very good at that game. Uh, so, um, so what's, what takes... Well, let me just finish off on that one. What happens, and I don't say they will or ever have, but if the Oxbridge type organisations get into trouble, they don't just click down to adapt it because they just haven't got the mechanisms in place. Um, so they, they will go right to the bottom of being um, crisis management, um, reactive, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But <laughs> when it is broke, and you haven't even got the toolkit to fix it, and so they're kind of. And I don't say it has ever happened, or necessarily will, but if it did, uh, that it would be quite quite serious. And places like Lancaster and Warwick um, are probably quite good because they are kind of between the two, but they still have it. And um, I don't know if you know, but well, you do know, uh, Lancaster University took over the Work Foundation two or three years ago, and. Uh, my good colleague Carrie Cooper stitched that up in about three weeks, and it was a cheap deal because their pension fund had gone, uh, you know, gone through the floor. So I think the World Foundation was built for for ten pounds. There's some kind of insurance scheme that took care of the pension fund, um, whereas some of the London universities or the colleges of London University. Uh, <coughs> were after it and they barely got it to their first committee meeting by the time Kerry Cooper and sort of stitched up the deal. Well, I wanted to go back a bit to things like MOOCs, sort of online learning, virtual learning, because that that's, seems to be an area where Oxford and Cambridge, well, they haven't joined Future Learn, the Open University scheme, whereas a lot of other UK universities okay, yeah. have. I wonder if that's an example of, of adapting to new, new technology, new ideas. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not at all surprised to to hear you say that. Um, and in a similar way, Oxford and Cambridge were fairly late in the game in starting business schools. Um, business schools starts in sixes with London and Manchester, and then there are places like Brantford and you know, Leeds that to some extent in the game, and then it spread. But Oxford and Cambridge with the side business school um, and. On what the other one's called, Judge. Judge of Cambridge side at Oxford. Um, they, I mean, at Cambridge had, sorry, Oxford had Templeton College, which was symbolically on the outskirts of Oxford and built with uh, money from a rich grocer called Templeton. I think he was a grocer. Um, uh, in Cambridge, um, management studies grew out of engineering and production management in the engineering department. Uh, <coughs> Springs up from various places, economics and engineering being from the more frequent ones. Um, <coughs> and, and, and so it goes on. Um, well, I think you're probably right about virtual learning. Some American universities, prestigious ones, uh, have for now put all their stuff online free. Um, uh, so they obviously recognise that it's a, a coming world. They want to be involved with it, but they need a toe in the water somewhere. Uh, as I suspect, Oxbridge haven't very much. Um, I mean, perhaps they're playing a waiting game in this case. If they case to be made for doing that, if they watch others and climb into the latest technology, uh, they may reap some advantages. I think um, 
various organisation British Airways, I think, did, that don't buy into the latest version of Windows. <laughs> they let it run for a year or two. Right, uh, yes. And then yeah. let other people do yeah. the debugging, and I think <coughs> the same thing happened in retail with point of sales, tills, Sainsbury's, and so on, let other people do the expensive experimentation and pilot schemes and don't get lumbered with any particular platform and kind of climb in when the dust has cleared a bit. It makes makes a certain amount of sense. Um, but I'm sure it's coming. We've done a study of virtual action learning. That's action learning sets. Learning from studying each other's problems. <coughs> um, and there we found a sort of distinction between high-tech and low-tech. Um, low-tech being just simple email exchanges or simple chat rooms at the most, or um, well, that would be intermediate, or telephone conferences, Skype conferences, power conferences, uh, whatever. And then high-tech would be, um, uh, what's the virtual reality, what's that one called? So Second Life. Second Life, for example, yeah. Well, I know that mo many universities do have um, campuses on Second Life. Um, probably replicating real universe and eventually it's hard to find any members of staff around <laughs> sometimes I'm told <laughs> and things like Cisco teleconferences yes, yes. you know fancy stuff um, but perhaps not surprisingly uh, the great majority are low tech and I remember the, the Open University um, held back on moving from paper to virtual to online or at least entirely we kept the paper versions open until you know, the great majority of their students or potential students had access to the web. Again, that, that makes sense. Um, does that deal with that one? I mean, there, there are many uh, virtual learning platforms. Um, uh, some of them. But from what you're saying, that they're as likely to get introduced by a company as, as by a university. Would that be right? The, the, the sorts of learning technologies have been yeah, probably more likely. Probably more, more. We did a study of corporate e-learning, and the great majority of it is used for um, um, technical training and uh, briefing people on corporate policies. In other words, you know, where there's kind of fairly solid knowledge or skills to be disseminated. And even I think if it was uh, Sun Microsystems, when it comes to leadership development, still do it face to face. Either because it works better or because the people spend quite enough time in front of screens anyway, thank you very much. Yes. And if you want to live a joke, I think it was a chap from Sun Microsystems or one of those like that, um, said it's really good, we've got this online module on work life balance. People can do it the evenings and weekends. <laughs> <laughs> well, the relief really part was he didn't see the joke. <laughs> it tells you something about their culture. Yes, so an, an actual course. But yeah. break away. It's yeah. still got its yeah. And there's a distinction between um, uh, e, e learning, or shall we call it, for um, uh, dissemination versus dialogue. You know, hold in the head, transfer learning versus people learning through discussion. Mm. And they get again, it seems to start with um, uh, dissemination, move on to dialogue.